Hi, everybody. This is week 11's lecture all about cell signaling. So if we were in class, this would have encompassed a couple different lectures, um, but I've kind of thrown everything and condensed it a little bit to fit into one presentation. All right, so I'll get my presentation up. We can get started. So today we're going to be talking about the different types of communication that cells have and the mechanism of how that works. So there's lots of different players. There's lots of different pieces that move. Um, so we're going to track the different components. And then by the end, we'll put a lot of it together. So we can break it down into signals, receptors, and pathways. So the theme of uh, the lecture for this week is all about how cells can communicate. And it's mediated by all of these different really cool molecules. Before we get started with the content, though, I just want to bring up a couple things. So instead of our usual lab activities, I'm going to find some uh, virtual or kind of alternative things, but still get you that information on the procedures. So there's lots of really cool topics in cell biology we haven't covered yet, things like CRISPR. Um, we were going to do a coding lab, um, but uh, we'll, we'll see what other things I can find. There's increasingly really good resources on a lot of these newer techniques. Um, so look out for those in the coming weeks. This week, we will do a virtual ELISA lab. So I don't know if you've heard about this procedure, um, but it's a way of testing antibodies for different diseases. So I think uh, if it hasn't already been developed, people are, are developing some kind of assay for the um, virus that causes COVID-19. People can perform an ELISA-type procedure. So look out for that. There will be questions in a questionnaire on Moodle uh, where you will get points for those lab activities. Um, so look out for those either later today or as you're watching this, um, it should be up on Moodle. To replace exam three, um, and we'll see about the final, more details to come on that later. Um, but in order to uh, continually check your progress on the material, we'll have lecture quizzes after these different lectures. So I, I didn't have one put together for last week, but that content will come up this week. Um, so look for that quiz on Moodle. Um, again, hopefully later today, which is Wednesday, which is when I'm recording this, um, but definitely very soon. Um, and because I really miss having you in class, um, I want to check in and see how things are going. So look for a Google form from me uh, very soon as well. Um, questions will be like, is the technology working okay? Are you able to um, get a handle on what we're covering so far? Does the schedule work? Um, things like that. Maybe even what other labs might be interesting. Um, I will get you feedback on your outlines and your metabolism questions very soon. Um, I want to get on top of the grading so that I can continually give you feedback. Um, now that we're not in class, it'll be more digital. Uh, but if at any point you want to Zoom, chat, uh, any point, let me know. We can have a meeting of some sort. Um, again, my goal is to get all this done as soon as possible. Um, but if there's any questions in the meantime, let me know. Um, I know our literature presentations will look a little bit different rather than presenting them during our usual lab time. Um, I'll have you guys record them and send them to me somehow. So again, all those details will come very soon. With that, we'll get into our topic for today, which is cell signaling. So we can think of four overall basic modes of how cells communicate. So we have contact dependent, uh, which is just like it sounds like. Um, two cells have to be in very, very close proximity. Some kind of membrane signal will interact with a membrane receptor on a target cell. Um, so you see this kind of signaling in development where one type of cell will start to differentiate um, and it will have these uh, signals that tell the cells nearby that it is differentiating into this cell. And so these will receive that signal um, and, and turn into something else. Another big area that we've talked, of, that we've talked about before is synaptic signaling. So when we talked about ion channels and our membranes, we, we thought about axons and how that action potential moves along. We looked at neurotransmitters. These are a special type of signal that are uh, 
located in vesicles that then move into that synapse space. And there are receptors on this target cell that bind those uh, neurotransmitters and continue that signal along. Uh, one other type of signaling is called paracrine. So paracrine signaling is uh, a local signal. So some kind of mediator signal molecule is not going to travel very far, kind of like local politics, so kind of like Jacksonville area um, concerns, as opposed to endocrine signaling, where we can secrete hormones that move throughout the body. Those signals can travel very far and wide. Paracrine is much closer to home. So paracrine signaling will have this uh, receptor, this receptor, and the signal molecules won't move terribly far. So kind of local area signaling compared to endocrine signaling, which can travel very, very far. So as we're looking at these different mechanisms, keep in mind that different signals are, are traveling uh, different, different speeds, different distances. So what could cells possibly have to talk about? Well, cells are getting signal input all of the time. So if we look at this diagram, in this case, the cell is getting signals A, B, and C. So these molecules are coming in. Um, they're causing cascades in this pathway. It's telling the cell to just keep doing what you're doing, survive, persist. Um, we could all use some of those signals today. So constantly getting some information input. We can take those same signals, though, and if they're combined with um, two other different molecules, um, instead of just surviving, but now it's being told to grow and divide. So those same signals that were telling it to survive earlier can be combined with two new things that tell it to uh, start cell division. If we look at another population of cells, they might still be getting those same A, B, C signals, but when we combine them with F and G, now it's telling the cell to differentiate. So maybe early in development, we have these signals that are keeping the cell alive, um, combined with these, these new signal molecules that tell it to turn into a skin cell or a heart cell or a Hulk cell or whatever this ends up turning into. Uh, but if we look at the bottom cell, um, we are, we're not seeing any input come in. A lack of any of these signals is going to tell the cell to die. There's a process called apoptosis that leads to cell death. We'll talk about that in a couple weeks. The point being that cells are getting input all the time, so all these processes are happening and ongoing, and different combinations of these signals lead to different messages, different outcomes for the cell. Um, so just like different combinations of molecules led to different messages, uh, the same molecule, acetylcholine, depending on what receptor it binds to, can lead to remarkably different processes. So in a heart pacemaker cell, when this receptor binds acetylcholine, the message that gets uh, passed down is to decrease the rate of firing. So acetylcholine will bind, our heart rate will decrease. If we take that same signal molecule, acetylcholine, and it binds to a receptor in our salivary glands, that message that gets passed down then is to secrete and increase saliva production. So one signal told our heart to slow down. That same signal told our salivary glands uh, to ramp up production. And the same acetylcholine molecule can bind ion channels and can uh, tell these muscle cells to contract. So if you want a summary of different signal molecules, there's a really good table in your book in chapter 16. I think it's 16.1 uh, um, to see all those different signals and the downstream effects they have. The idea for this slide just being um, multiple different receptors combine the same signal molecule and, and lead to drastically different changes. So once a cell receives a signal, it can lead to many different uh, downstream pathways, and those can be really fast reactions. So fast in this case meaning uh, maybe less than a second to a minute or two. Some of those changes after the cell receives the signal take much, much longer. 
uh, on the order of minutes to hours. And the difference between these two processes um, are fast reactions will just uh, have different proteins that interact. So we might activate a protein, it might activate another protein, which activates an enzyme, which can go on um, to lead to its altered cell behavior. So those are all pretty quick, right? Everything's always moving around in the cell. Things are, are changing really fast. However, if a signal involves transcription, if a signal involves some kind of modification of uh, DNA transcription or um, translation of proteins, those responses tend to be a lot longer. And this is due to those cascades and the number of things that need to happen before we can see changes in the RNA and the new proteins being synthesized. Right. So this process of going from DNA to protein can take a while. So whenever we're looking at pathways that change gene expression, those are going to take longer than just turning on or turning off different proteins. All right, so we'll, we'll see examples of each of these in the next few slides. So when we're thinking about the different receptors, there are kind of four main types. So one is a little less common. These are intracellular receptors. So in the, in the examples we've seen so far, we've got nice membrane proteins that will accept some kind of signal, um, but some signals are small enough if they're hydrophobic, they can get through that membrane really easily. They'll be able to find a receptor in the cytosol. And more often than not, these signal molecules will then be uh, transported into the nucleus. So one class is our intracellular receptors. Um, the other groups are all cell surface receptors. So we see these much more often when we're looking at cell signaling. They will be some kind of membrane-bound protein that will bind some kind of ligand, some extracellular signal, and then it will transduce that signal. So the binding of this protein uh, will either change the shape or will somehow activate something else down the line um, and introduce an intracellular signaling cascade. And so the three flavors of membrane-bound of cell surface receptors are ion channel coupled receptors. So we've seen a lot of those um, when we looked at membrane ion channels. So these are receptors that are either ion channels themselves or receptors that activate ion channels. Uh, another big group are G protein coupled receptors. Uh, we'll get into what G proteins are, but these are proteins that uh, interact with GTP and GD. And then another big group are enzyme-coupled receptors. And so these are enzymes that are in the membrane that bind, and then their actions, their functions um, can, can continue the signals on. We're going to look specifically at um, enzyme-coupled receptors called receptor tyrosine kinases. OK, so first we're going to start out with our intracellular receptors. So steroids are a really good example of these signals that can cross the membrane. Um, so in this case, we're looking at cortisol, which is um, produced by our adrenal glands when we're stressed. Um, so it's a really good thing. None of us are stressed out at the moment. Um, but if we are, if we find ourselves with a lot of stress, we can deal with that by taking a really deep breath in and exhaling. Um, and remembering our little cortisol molecules are uh, going through our membranes. Once that cortisol molecule goes through, it's going to interact with a protein called a nuclear receptor protein. So even though it's called a nuclear receptor, uh, it's hanging out in the cytosol. But when it binds cortisol, its shape is going to change. Um, so this activates this receptor protein. So these little kind of pink triangles just indicate that it, now this enzyme is active and able to do work. This compound, this receptor plus signal, is going to be brought into the nucleus uh, using that process that we talked about last week. Um, so this then is going to bind those other receptors and come in. Um, 
But once it's inside the nucleus, this protein will then bind to DNA and regulate gene expression. So cortisol finds this nuclear receptor protein, and this complex moves into the nucleus to uh, influence gene expression. So this is going to be one of those more slower response, um, but this is one pathway that uses that intracellular network. Okay, so that was intracellular. More often than not, we're going to have something that's bound to the membranes and that's going to um, relay the signal going forward. And so there's many mechanisms that go into these. Um, these have many, many steps usually, and at each step, we're able to regulate it. So these pathways have evolved um, to be really sophisticated. They can lead to multiple different outcomes. Um, so we'll kind of track and see what kind of directions those can take. So there, this membrane receptor of the different flavors we'll discuss in a few is going to bind some kind of signal molecule. More often than not, that leads to some kind of conformational change. So the protein's going to change its shape on here. This can activate other proteins. It can relay the signal. So this portion is just relaying the signal that's coming in. Often there's other kind of scaffolded proteins nearby. So it's going to change shape. It's going to activate another protein. And so this protein is, is going to transduce and amplify the signal. So transduce just means uh, we're, we're turning the signal into something else. So it originated with this molecule and due to changes in these proteins, now we have this active enzyme that's able to generate new signal molecules. We'll see some examples of those. These then can go forth in the cell and interact with other proteins. So this one here is activated and it's amplifying the signal. So it's able to create a lot of new signal molecules. These signal molecules then will interact with lots of other proteins. And so often then that signal will become integrated so this small messenger has recruited or activated or interacted with these three different proteins. These three proteins now can come together and interact with this hypothetical enzyme protein. Um, and now we're distributing the signal here between three outcomes. So we can start to see how many different pieces fit into just one signal. So we can alter our metabolism alter our cell shape, or alter gene expression. And these three disparate outcomes can be related by similar signal molecules, um, different uh, feedback regulations might turn off or turn on only certain pathways, certain proteins. So these different molecules can do different things to our signals. We're seeing a relay of information. We're seeing transduction amplification, integration, and distribution of signals. So not all of these have to come into place in one pathway, um, but often at least a few of them are combined to lead to the final outcome for our cell. Okay, so we're looking at a lot of different players. These are a lot of moving parts. Um, so feel free to refer back to your book and uh, look this over, replay, whatever you need to do to, uh, to study these molecules. So not only um, proteins are acting um, in, these, in these pathways, but some dissolved gases can serve as, as signals. So NO stands for nitric oxide, not to be confused with laughing gas or nitrous oxide. Um, but NO, nitric oxide, can function as one of these intracellular signals. Um, so in section A here is the cross-section of a simple blood vessel. So we have our endothelial cells right on the inside, smooth muscle um, here. Um, so nitric oxide is made by breaking down arginine. And our lovely acetylcholine can bind to some kind of receptor in the membrane. 
So this signaling pathway then tells arginine to get broken down into nitric oxide. This is happening in those endothelial cells, so with these little orange nuclei right here. And O-synthase is the enzyme that's going to create this nitric oxide. Because it's a small gas, it can just diffuse through the membranes really easily. Um, it's going to do this very rapidly. So the half-life of this gas in cells is only 5 to 10 seconds. So this is one of those really rapid um, reactions. So uh, NO is going to diffuse very quickly into the nearby cells, into the nearby smooth muscle cells with these brown nuclei right here. And what NO tells the cell to do, it's going to bind to an enzyme called guanylyl cyclase. So the cyclase circle, um, this enzyme converts GTP, so one of these energy, energy carrier molecules, into cyclic GNP. So a molecule um, that is more cyclical, uh, guanine monophosphate. So nitric, nitric oxide binds this enzyme that makes cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP is going to carry the signal forward. It's going to tell smooth muscle cells to relax. So NO is a, a dissolved gas that's going to um, diffuse into the membrane, turn on an enzyme that creates cyclic GMP, and this cascades into smooth muscle relaxation. Uh, so actually the drug Viagra works by inhibiting the breakdown of the cyclic GMP. So it's going to um, increase the length of that signal so that um, people that are taking this drug can feel the effects uh, for much longer than if they did not take it. So that, again, works by not breaking down this signal. So often when we're looking at these different processes, there's going to be um, very quick switches that turn them off. So every piece of this process is going to be highly regulated, um, which makes sense because we don't want signals to stay on for a long period of time. We want to be able to make the change and turn it off. All right, so our light switches, we can turn them on. We don't want them to stay on too long. We want to be able to turn them off when we need. So all of these different pathways will have ways of turning them on and off. Okay, so that idea of molecular switches takes on a couple different flavors. So before we have mentioned protein phosphorylation, right? So we can add on a phosphate and that can activate a protein. So here, um, our cell is just sitting idly by. We get some kind of signal on a membrane-bound protein probably. That signal then will, will go down that chain, and somewhere along the line, a protein kinase will be activated. Protein kinases use um, energy. They take a phosphate from ATP to put on a protein that can turn it on. So we've got a signal. It's uh, led to this protein kinase adding a phosphate to this molecule, which is now turned on and functional. So this functional protein then can it continue the signal going um, or can lead to those molecular changes in the cell. So we're, we're switching it on by using a kinase to add a phosphate to activate a protein. When we want to turn that switch off, uh, a phosphatase will come in, remove that phosphate, and turn that protein off. So when we get a signal, it, this kinase puts a phosphate on. When we need to turn that signal off, a phosphatase comes by, removes that phosphate, and turns it off. Another type of molecular switch um, are, are G proteins. So when they're off, they have GDP bound. Some kind of signal will come in. There's uh, specific proteins that exchange GDP for GTP. When these proteins have GTP bound, they are active. They can then uh, contribute to the signal going forward or make changes to other proteins. When we want to turn this off, there might be some component on this enzyme itself or another protein can come in and hydrolyze that phosphate, which turns that into GTP. 
So to turn it on, some signal tells a protein to replace this GDP with GTP that turns on the protein so the signal can continue. When we take off that phosphate from the GTP, we then inactivate our G proteins. So G proteins are important for receptors and for, for lots of other processes, also for downstream signaling. So we're gonna see different examples of, of these different switches. So G proteins are also called GTP aces because there's that process of uh, taking off and putting on GTP and GDP. So small G proteins or GTP aces um, are, are that big flavor of molecular switch. So like I alluded to on the last slide, here is this protein. Um, we've seen this before when we looked at nuclear transport. So those also use these small G proteins. Um, but guanine nucleotide exchange factor. Exchange, just like exchanging clothes at the store, this enzyme will take that GDP and replace it with GTP to activate our G protein. So GEF proteins are able to activate our GTP aces or our G proteins. So now we have this active Monomeric just means that there's one protein. In a few slides, we'll see um, proteins with multiple subunits. So these are called monomeric to distinguish these from other big signaling molecules. Okay, so we have the signal on, but we want to turn it off. We'll recruit, recruit this gap protein, and that will phosphorylize um, this GTP and remove that phosphate. Okay, so GES activate, GAP proteins deactivate our G proteins. And again, these are just really good molecular switches. So we can turn them on, we can turn them off. When they're on, they can uh, keep these signals going in the cell or um, activate other proteins. When they're off, um, they're just awaiting for their instructions. So if we remember back to how vesicles work, we looked at these Rab proteins. So in this diagram, they're just little yellow um, cartoons. Um, but Rab proteins are a really good example of these monomeric GTP aces, or G proteins. Um, so these recognize the tethering proteins right here. Um, so this is a very important step for vesicle fusion. And again, vesicles are fusing all over the cell. So we need specific Rab proteins for specific areas of the cell. And people who have looked at this have found all kinds of different examples. So when we take any kind of vesicle or phagosome is when um, a cell is uh, brought in something and, and put it inside of a vesicle, um, these Rab proteins then are gonna be specific for the locations it needs to go. So more often than not, vesicles are being transported by motor proteins. So these microtubules um, to, to bring it along will have these Rab, will recognize Rab7. Once this vesicle gets brought to a certain area, say the Golgi, it will have a Rab1 uh, protein that will, that will recognize it. So all of these different Rab proteins are examples of GTP aces. So I'm not going to uh, hold you responsible to knowing which one is which. This is just to show that there's multiple different types of this one protein so that we can bring vesicles where we need them to go. Okay, so those were the different switches. Um, now we're going to move back to the receptor protein. So we've seen ion channel coupled receptors quite a bit, so we're not going to dwell on those too much. Um, G protein coupled receptors. So these are receptors that work with specific kinds of G proteins. So these are those big um, multi subunit ones compared to the monomeric ones we saw just now. And in addition, we have enzyme coupled receptors. So these are receptors that have uh, enzymatic um, pieces that can perform uh, reactions. And we'll see specific examples of these receptor tyrosine kinases. Again, kinases add phos uh, phosphate groups 
so we'll see how these um, receptors couple with these enzymes. So G protein coupled receptors have this kind of very similar formula. They're all over the tree of life. They perform all kinds of different functions in the cell. Um, they're very diverse in their function, but in their shape, uh, they're, they're very similar. So almost all of them that people have studied have this very specific seven um, spanning membrane domain. So they have seven alpha helices that fit in the membrane right here. They all have some kind of extracellular binding site. So in this case, these have a couple of carbohydrates here that will recognize uh, some signal molecules. And then they have um, an extensive cytosolic side that will interact with those GTPases or G proteins. So again, a uh, place where ligands can bind, where those signals will bind, a seven spanning membrane domain, and then an area that interacts with G proteins. So the G proteins in particular that these um, gene protein coupled receptors bind, so GPCR just stands for gene pro G protein coupled receptor. These GPCRs will interact with heterotrimeric G proteins. So hetero meaning different, trimeric meaning three. So these G proteins all have three subunits and they're named alpha, beta, and gamma. So very often when scientists are naming things in a sequence, they'll, they'll use the Greek alphabet. Uh, so this GPCR interacts with the alpha subunit. So kind of going outside to in, the alpha subunit is interacting with the receptor. The alpha subunit is also what binds GTP and GDP. And when the protein is inactive, we have GDP bound. When the, when the protein is inactive, also all three subunits are interacting with each other. So the subunit in the middle right here is our beta subunit. And this is almost always in, in contact with the gamma subunit. So the beta gamma complex is over here. The beta gamma complex is linked to the membrane with this little lipid linker right here as well as the alpha subunit is also linked to the membrane. So again, alpha, beta, and gamma. So when they're inactive, they're all nice and cozy. When we take that other protein and exchange it for GTP, right? So this binds some receptor, or it binds some signal. Um, that signal binding causes a change in the shape of this receptor. That change in shape then um, activates this protein by getting that GEF to exchange the GDP for GTP. When GTP is bound, the alpha subunit dissociates with this receptor. And not only does the alpha subunit separate from the receptor, the alpha subunit also separates from the beta gamma complex over here. So when GTP binds, it then allows the activation for the alpha subunit and for the beta gamma complex. Okay, so this is the G protein coupled receptor. It interacts with this heterotrimeric G protein right here. When GTP is bound, then we can have uh, the continuation of the signaling process. So these GTP bound G proteins, so they're active, these active proteins then activate other enzymes to keep the signal going. So in this case, here's another example of our inactive state. Uh, GDP is bound right here. When we get some sort of signal that then changes and activates these subunits, we can recruit then other membrane bound proteins and so now this other membrane bound protein um, can continue to do work. So this piece is now activated and it can continue the signal.
So those are all um, G protein coupled receptors and those G proteins and how they work. So we're going to move on to another group. Um, and then at the end of this lecture, we'll, we'll put all these different pieces together. So that last component of those membrane-bound receptors are enzyme-coupled receptors. So instead of using a G protein to continue the signal, instead of just opening or closing ion channels, these enzyme-coupled receptors um, are going to directly activate other proteins. So the biggest group of these is a family called receptor tyrosine kinases. Tyrosine being one of those amino acids. These also phosphorylate proteins, so receptor tyrosine kinases. Often you see them as dimers. So our G proteins were three different subunits. These are dimers. These are two almost identical proteins that work together. So these are two receptor tyrosine kinases. Often a signal will come in. It can be something like growth factor or some other kind of ligand that is also a dimer. This fits nicely between these two proteins, so it recruits them to come closer together. Once these two receptors are in close proximity because it's been bound um, by some kind of signal, these actually phosphorylate each other. So these um, loops right here have a lot of tyrosine residues. These two domains here will phosphorylate each other. It's called autophosphorylation. And now these two enzymes are active and can recruit other proteins. So we'll see what this process looks like. So this is a figure from your book. Um, some kind of signal molecule, in this case, it's a dimer, is going to interact. It's going to bring the two tyrosine kinases together. When they're in close proximity, they're active, and they can phosphorylate each other. So there are many, many sites where these um, phosphates can become bound. There are many sites on here where new proteins can come in and become activated. And so often these work in conjunction with each other or will um, continue the signal along. So this is a uh, an example of how we can relay and amplify some kind of signal coming in. And so not only do these work alone, but these can also be combined with uh, small GTPases. So in this example, right, they've come together to form a dimer. This active um, enzyme can become phosphorylated. It has recruited something called an adapter protein. So now this is activated. It can bind something called a RAS, GEF, right? So GEF are able to exchange GDP and GTP. So because it's bound to this protein, it can now activate a nearby G protein. So this protein then is called a RAS. The RAS GEF is able to activate it. This active RAS protein can then contribute to the signal. Specifically, RAS G proteins can activate something called a MAP kinase cascade. So again, kinases are things that phosphorylate other proteins. Um, sometimes, instead of just having one to one, um, there's multiple cascades, so almost like a waterfall. Uh, multiple proteins phosphorylate each other, which then phosphorylate another one, which then phosphorylates another one to continue a signal on down. So one uh, cascade in particular is called the MAP kinase cascade. So named after its, its final player here, um, there are actually three kinases involved, creatively named MAP kinase. MAP kinase kinase, and of course, MAP kinase kinase kinase. So this RAS G protein is active due to the um, procedure from that earlier slide. It interacts with this MAP KKK, this MAP kinase kinase kinase. The kinase uses ATP to phosphorylate MAP kinase kinase. 
This protein is now active. It phosphorylates MAP kinase, which then can activate many other proteins. So either um, proteins that change other proteins or regulatory proteins that can change gene expression. So look out for kinase cascades, look out for other cascades um, when you encounter cell signaling in the future. So we've looked at lots of different types of receptors. We've looked at some of the ways that we can kind of start the signal. We've looked at a couple ways where we can continue the signal going. But in between um, the steps on the last slide, there are still lots of different molecules in between. Um, so we, so far we've seen GTPases, those small monomeric or those big heterotrimeric ones. We've seen phosphorylation cascades, right? And phosphorylations can turn genes can turn proteins on and off. So those G protein signals, those phosphorylation signals. Um, and now we're going to look at some of those molecules in between. So some of those secondary messengers, some of those molecules that can continue the signal um, by interacting with other proteins inside the cell. And again, any particular signaling event might use a couple of these pieces. It could use all of them. Um, we're starting to look at very sophisticated switches. All of these different steps can be regulated. Um, so if it seems complicated, it's because these are the ways in which uh, we're able to tell cells to do almost everything. So we're going to look and see these uh, four different secondary messenger molecules. So we talked about cyclic GMP at the beginning of this lesson. Um, much more common, much more uh, used throughout the cell is cyclic AMP. So adenosine monophosphate. So we take an ATP molecule, um, an enzyme called adenylyl cyclase when it's active, will remove those two phosphates. It will then combine and um, make this into more of a ring structure into a cyclical molecule. So this is a secondary messenger that can then be um, used to turn on other proteins. When we want to turn the signal off, we can degrade cyclic AMP using an enzyme called the phosphodiesterase. This is just going to cleave the cyclic AMP, um, take some water, but then we have AMP, adenosine monophosphate. Okay, so adenylyl cyclase. Uh, increases cyclic AMP, phosphodiesterase decreases and breaks down cyclic AMP. So why is this molecule important as a secondary messenger? Well, it's able to bind something called protein kinase A. So there's lots of different kinases involved. This one in, in particular uh, does a couple things. And so the way this works, cyclic AMP is able to bind some kind of regulatory subunit the change uh, in these proteins allows these subunits to dissociate. And so now we have these active pieces of protein kinase. And so this leaves these active regions free to phosphorylate other proteins. And all of this is regulated by a G protein coupled receptor. So starting all the way with our signal, the cell is going to notice the signal coming in. It will bind this gene protein coupled receptor. The conformational change here allows that alpha subunit to dissociate. Um, we have a GTP bound, so this is active. It's been able to recruit this other membrane protein. In this case, it's adenylyl cyclase. And that's the enzyme then that creates cyclic AMP from ATP. Our cyclic AMP molecules are able to bind. Now we have some active protein kinase A. These specifically will travel into the nucleus. It'll travel through the nuclear pore using those um, mechanisms we talked about last class, or excuse me, last lecture. In this case, it's going to phosphorylate a protein that will then regulate gene expression. 
So don't worry about the specific pathway. Just be able to follow along from signal molecule, GPCR, G protein activation, adenyl cyclase activation, PKA activation, phosphorylation of transcriptional regulator. So some specific examples of these different pathways, um, PKA, this protein kinase A is involved in uh, hormone biosynthesis, um, and also the production of proteins that are involved in long-term memory. So as you're studying these different proteins, you can thank them for being able to remember them um, a couple weeks from now. So this isn't the only destination that PKA has. It can also phosphorylate other proteins in the cytosol. Um, there's an example of that in your book. Okay, so cyclic AMP, at the end of the day, is a secondary messenger. So this original signal molecule is able to create this little messenger that can then boost the signal um, and, and activate other proteins. So another few of the secondary messengers are generated by phospholipase C. And those two messengers are called inositol triphosphate and diacylglycerol. So the enzyme phospholipase um, just like it sounds, it's going to cleave a phospholipid. So phospholipase just takes a phospholipid and cuts it uh, into two pieces. Specifically, phospholipase C will take an inositol phospholipid, and these are specifically on the cytosolic side of the cell membrane, the plasma membrane. And this enzyme clips... Um, so this enzyme clips our phospholipid. So here is our triphosphate. And here is our diacylglycerol. So the enzyme uh, cleaves it right here. It creates the lipid diacylglycerol, or DAG. And it also creates this inositol uh, triphosphate called IP3. So this one's enzyme cleaves these lipids, creates DAG, and creates IP3. So these two are each their own individual secondary messenger. So IP3 can move into the cytosol. It binds um, membrane proteins on the ER and releases calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. So all along the ER are these uh, calcium pumps that keep a very strong gradient of high concentrations of calcium inside of the ER and very low concentrations of calcium in the cytosol. So this IP3 signal molecule uh, will bind to ion channels in the ER membrane and release calcium. DAG, on the other hand, stays in the membrane. It'll diffuse through. Um, this activates protein kinase C. So we saw protein kinase A was activated by AMP. Protein kinase C is activated by DAG, activated by phospholipase C. Okay, so IP3 releases calcium. DAG will activate protein kinase C. Um, so IP3 generates lots of calcium. Um, calcium itself then is that last secondary messenger we're going to talk about. So like I said earlier, pumps and ion channels are going to keep cytosolic concentrations very, very low uh, and very, very high in the ER. So calcium is released from the ER in response to IP3. Um, so in this series of images, you can see the calcium is labeled. You can see it being released from the ER and transporting through the cell and this is taking place over, you know, 100 or so seconds. So it's a very transient signal. Um, why would it be very quick? Why wouldn't we want a bunch of calcium ions to linger in the cell? Well, one reason is because they're going to continue on um, as signal molecules. So we don't want 
lots of signals bouncing around. We want to tightly control what these turn on and turn off. And the other reason why the signal doesn't stick around very long is because these pumps are still active. All right, so once channels open, ions can fly through. Um, but if we close them very quickly, then that wave of calcium will, will go through. But those pumps will keep, keep working. So calcium is a very transient signal, very quick signal, um, but a very strong one as well. And so something that calcium binds to is a protein called calmodulin. So it's a protein that uses calcium, and it uh, modulates other proteins. And this is a really cool protein because once calcium binds um, to the, the special sites, the active sites, it actually changes the shape in a way that allows calmodulin to bind another target protein. So when calmodulin and calcium are together, it's able to change shape drastically and wrap itself around the target protein. So an important signaling molecule. And so putting all of this together from when the cell receives the signal to the activated um, protein kinase C. We can follow the signal that GPCR is bound, changes shape. The alpha subunit of our G protein binds GTP and is active. It dissociates from that beta gamma complex. This activated protein, this activated alpha, can then activate phospholipase C. This phospholipase clips a lipid, creates, um, so it clips this inositol phospholipid right here, creates IP3. This molecule binds to calcium channels, which release the calcium from the ER. This calcium can go on to bind to calmodulin but it can also bind to the protein kinase C, which is activated in part by DAG, the lipid portion of the, the lipid that stays in the membrane. So protein kinase C is bound by DAG and is also bound by calcium and is now activated. We can continue on the signal. So those dimers, those receptor tyrosine kinases, can also use calcium as a signal. And so we'll walk through this diagram together. So this receptor is going to bind our dimer, bring it in close proximity. It can move through the membrane. Because they're in close proximity now, they're phosphorylating each other on these tyrosine uh, sites. So these cytosolic proteins can bind to the active site. So we have this blue phospholipase C that is recruited to this receptor tyrosine kinase. It's activated. This phospholipase can now cleave this lipid to create IP3 and DAG. The IP3 releases calcium from the channel. Meanwhile, another protein has been recruited. Um, this is going to regulate the RAS pathway. RAS proteins are able to turn on the MAP kinase cascade. This MAP kinase cascade can lead to transcription regulation. And the calcium also can contribute to other signals. All right, so signal, receptor, activates other proteins. These um, activate further proteins that can change the signal. They can also create secondary messenger molecules that can then activate 